Okay, so <laughs> we thought we would begin by telling you that uh, we were asked to speak about the history of the discipline of American art history, which is a very big topic for less than an hour. <laughs> so we focused it around um, the way in which writing about American art has shifted from initially being interested in what was recognizably American about American art uh, until this moment when I think that uh, Americanists are much more interested in the multiple centers and practices and encounters between peoples um, across the globe, including the encounter of scholars. Uh, and certainly the field of American art has changed tremendously thanks to the Terra Foundation, which has funded dialogues between scholars all over the world uh, who bring different perspectives to the field of American art. We also thought we would tell you, situate our own intellectual background a bit. Um, we're generationally, uh, this, uh, well, we are of the same generation. We both were in graduate school in the 1980s and trained by the very few university-trained art historians who specialized in American art. I was at Stanford University and I worked with a professor named Wanda Korn and Rick was at Yale where he worked with Jules Prown among others. And these were really self, really self-trained, uh, Wanda Korn and Jules Prown in the field of American art. Uh, they came of age in the 1960s and uh, worked with scholars who did not specialize in American art. Um, so we, we are that generation. And I think it's also important for us to mention that part of the embrace and uh, appreciation for American art is not just something that was generated within the university. One could say that um, the museum, culture, curators, and several key institutions, museums in the US um, were very involved in bringing um, the history of American art to greater attention. Um, of course, we have key institutions like the Whitney Museum of American Art uh, in New York City. Um, but I would also add that another uh, key uh, um, institution uh, in, um, in celebrating and recognizing the importance of American art um, is in Washington, D.C. Uh, that institution uh, has had many names over the course of, of the past 50 years. It is now known as the Smithsonian American Art Museum. But in the 1960s, uh, when it really came into being, there were a series of, of, of directors and curators, um, such as David Scott, um, Joshua Taylor, um, Adele Dombreskin and others who really uh, brought and um, brought um, early and important little figures who had 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 not been as well known as let's say a, a Thomas Aikens or a Winslow Homer, but but they brought um, these other artists to the attention of the public, and it really was quite transformative, and it encouraged um, the public to understand that um, American art is not just um, um, something that comes out of the academy, but sometimes it's art that is made uh, in, uh, in, in people's communities uh, without the sanctioning of, 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 of the intellectuals. Yeah, yeah that's, I hadn't really thought about that, but there, from the beginning there was a very interesting dialogue between the academy and the museum world. Um, and the first art historians who were out of the academy were very interested in defining what was recognizably American about American art, whereas somebody like Joshua Taylor was pushing at, I think, some of those assumptions. Uh, and so in order to give you a sense of how the field has changed, we thought we would look at one example of a portrait 
and then shift to landscape painting because the initial writing about the field w- did focus on portraiture in the Uni- in what was then British North America and on um, landscape painting and again tried to identify something that was recognizably American uh, and so I've we've chosen this painting by Copley, Portrait of Paul Revere from 1768 to give you a sense of how the literature has changed even in the field of portraiture. Um, Maybe 40 years ago, an Americanist might have looked at this for evidence of a Protestant um, worldview, mercantile and social ambitions tempered by Calvinist moderation, and they might have pointed out the blunt linear style and the attention to material goods um, as evidence of that world view of, that emphasized industry, individuality, and prosperity. The problem with that approach is that it really uh, treated all portraits, no matter where they were made on, along the Atlantic seaboard, as exemplifying this one world view. And over time, uh, a portrait like this has actually become much more interesting as other questions were asked about it. And uh, scholars began to imagine colonial images as being part of a mercantile economy that stretched across the Atlantic and the Pacific, involved trade with Europe, um, involved, of course, the European exploration and conquest of the Americas, and uh, trade with Africa and Asia, looking at how these works are always attentive to the varied experiences of settlers, natives, and uh, enslaved peoples. So the uh, next generation of scholars might have looked at the dress of Paul Revere and what it reveals about him in his profession. The fact that he, at this point, by the way, of course, Paul Revere was known for his anti-British politics, but he still hadn't gone on his famous midnight ride that comes later. Um, And he was a, a silversmith. So he's dressed here, though, without a wig. And he also doesn't have a coat. He just has his Work sh- his shirt and it's opened at the collar, which um, a man, a gentleman, would not have been seen in public in that way. This was certainly an indication of a laboring social class. And you see that he is posed holding that teapot. Um, he's at a counter, probably the shop, his shop counter, not a work table but he has the tools that he'll be using to engrave that teapot, to probably put a family crest onto the teapot um, for the owners of the teapot. And so another com- or, um, analysis, interpretation that, that people have subsequently put forth about this picture is to note the relationship between the teapot and his head, the way that he holds his head with one hand and he holds the teapot with the other, suggesting that while he's a laborer, he is claiming some sort of intellectual role for his workmanship, that there's a relationship between the head and this material object in his hand. Um, More recently, there is a younger scholar by the name of Ethan uh, Ethan Ethan Lasser, (laughs) who has published a very interesting article that looks at the way that when this portrait was painted, Paul Revere was in the midst of a financial crisis, um, that there was uh, no longer market for luxury goods, Uh, that had dried up, um, that this painting was probably exhibited in a public site and was meant as a kind of advertisement. This is what I can offer to you. Um, These are my skills. And it's also made the year after the Townsend Acts uh, imposed by those British who, of course, controlled British North America at the time and imposed a duty on tea and other imported goods. And as a result, Bostonians who were politically critical of the the, um, king boycotted tea. 
So we know then that there's a lot of political activity around tea at this time. Moreover, we know that the silver that would have been used to make that teapot comes from Mexico. The sugar that would have gone into the tea came from slaves working in the Caribbean, um, uh, working in sugarcane. Um, and so there's a lot of pol politics around the economics of this picture. Moreover, um, the teapot then becomes no longer just a symbol of luxury, but also of defiance. We know Paul Revere in this year only made one silver teapot. Um, so it's a promotional image, but it's a promotional image that is steeped in politics. All that to say that as Americanists have turned uh, more to the specifics of costume, pose, materiality, economics, um, that we can see that this picture testifies to a transatlantic world of exchange and political strife. And I don't know if you want to add anything. We have many images to show you uh, today, so I'm just going to add a little tiny bit to what uh, Professor Whiting has so brilliantly laid out for you, and I'll just talk about this on a formal level. I'm really fascinated that at this moment, um, well, actually throughout this time period, um, Copley is the most important, significant, talented uh, painter in the colonies. And so this is someone who understands um, uh, how to make a painting, how to, how to render illusion uh, in, in paint. And what I find so fascinating about this work is that we get this, this depth uh, in, in, in the beautiful uh, cloth um, in Paul Revere's shirt, uh, that incre incredible illumination on the table. And then he gives us the edge of the table at the bottom of the picture. And I just, I'm so intrigued by that because it's, it, in, in many ways he's saying in a very proto-modern way, it's a painting. <laughs> this is flat. <laughs> You know, this is, not, this is not a world that you think you can walk into. By suddenly giving us that edge, you know, it's flat. Now, I don't know if he thought that really, but maybe subliminally, he was reminding us of illusion and the, and the possibilities of playing with illusion within the context of, 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 of canvas and oil. Well, uh, we're going to focus mainly on landscape since the theme is nature. <laughs> um, and this gives us an opportunity actually to return to the idea that the initial ge first generation of Americanists wanted to figure out what was unique about American art. And in part, this has to do with a Cold War post-Cold War sense of American exceptionalism, that there must be something special and different about America. Um, in a way, it also be, speaks to a bit of an inferiority complex that we need to justify this art so it doesn't look like it's just second-rate um, European art um, by seeing how it, ta it speaks to an Amer something essential about an American character. And again, that first generation wanted to see these landscape paintings as testifying to a kind of um, American Eden as opposed to that over-civilized Europe over, the, over here. <laughs> uh, and that um, we could see God's hand in this. It was a kind of you know, discovery of an American Eden that existed on the continent. Uh, so, uh, but since then, of course, subsequent generations of Americanists have complicated these ideas of the landscape and situated them politically and historically. Uh, so we bring in Robert Duncanson. I don't know if you want to speak. Sure. Um, Robert Duncanson was uh, uh, an artist based in uh, Cincinnati, uh, Ohio. Uh, he uh, was, um, and just to give you a little meditation on geography, uh, Cincinnati is literally um, steps, miles away from Kentucky, 
And so we are literally on the border in the 1850s and 1860s for, um, for people who are interested in, in the burning issue of this moment, uh, emancipation, slavery, what have you. If you are on one side of the river, um, you can be free. And if you're on the other side of the river, you are enslaved. Um, I don't know if any of you had a chance to uh, read the very important novel by Toni Morrison, Beloved, Beloved. Um, a film was made by Oprah Winfrey, Beloved, that deals with a, a, a cataclysmic moment uh, in the lives of, of, of several slaves who, who, who venture beyond Kentucky into Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I'm giving you all of that as, as just a kind of a backdrop for um, view of Cincinnati from Covington, Kentucky by Duncanson for you to understand that geography is loaded. Geography is political. And in something as placid and beautiful as this landscape is, built into his designation of where we are, what we are seeing, um, the, the locations between um, one side of the quote-unquote Mason-Dixon line and the other side is, is the difference between um, people having full personhood versus people not having any connection or, or ability to assert themselves as individuals. And I just want to add to that, we actually know some of the specific numbers about who lived or who exactly was living in Covington. Um, there were at that time 50 free African Americans living in Covington, but 100 slaves and 15,000 white people, as Professor Powell explained, on the other side of the river, African Americans were uh, free. Of course, there were still strict discriminatory laws about where one could live and work and so forth. But um, a, when in the wintertime the river froze over, Covington was a place where African Americans from Kentucky might escape to the other side of the river to freedom. So this um, picture then becomes not just one about an American Eden, a, har a harmonious scene, but the difference between a rural lifestyle, you do see an African American working here in the foreground, versus that bustling economic center on the other side of the river. And throughout this period, pictures are very involved in these issues of slavery and the, what leads up to the, the Civil War. This is one of my favorite photographs from this period. Uh, it's a photograph that often appears in histories of, of slavery in the U.S. Um, this work in particular is by uh, uh, Harry uh, Moore. Uh, it's a scene of, of enslaved people um, harvesting sweet potatoes uh, in uh, Edisto County, uh, South Carolina. Uh, I mean, when I look at this, I think of Millet. I think of Barbizon. I mean, this is a scene that is so beautiful and placid. It's as if the, the photographer, and, and I'm pretty su sure the photographer, has, has told the, the, the slaves to just freeze, just stand still while I get my camera and my daguerreotype, oh, this is an album imprint, I'm sorry, get my, as I get my camera prepared, don't move. So one really senses a kind of uh, an arrested moment uh, in time. And, and one can almost take their mind and, and think about something that has nothing to do with oppression, that has nothing to do with labor, that has nothing to do with the violence that was slavery. And one can maybe almost fantasize and say this is so placid, a la, you know, Melee's, uh, you know, images uh, from um, not very far from here. Uh, even a picture which ostensibly has nothing to do with local politics, there are no figures in there, there's uh, not about a specific place uh, such as Covington, Kentucky. Twilight in the Wilderness from 1860, that grand romantic uh, sunset uh, can also be understood as alluding uh, to national dissension during the Civil War and the way in which red, that red is reflected in the river suggesting, you know, the blood that is spilled during the Civil War. Uh, and we certainly have no shortage of 
landscape images which suggest that the disruption of a pastoral ideal of the landscape is owing to the South um, and its uh, seceding from the Union um, and beginning the Civil War. So I'm, we're showing you on the top left a photograph by Timothy O'Sullivan, which appeared in a spectacular book, uh, photographic album about the Civil War, which was published in 1866 by Alexander Gardner. It's two volumes, um, and each picture is accompanied by a, uh, about a paragraph or two of text. You read the text first, you turn the page, and you see the photograph with a label and the uh, the name of the photographer. So the gardener takes us on a tour. He memorializes particular places, sites of, of battle. Um, he, because of the technique of photography at that time, often his photographs are belated, that is, they come after the battle. The, the technique was such that you couldn't take action shots. Uh, so we do see evidence of a destroyed landscape. But it, this book also contains some of the first images of dead bodies, which were tremendously shocking. When you read uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, for example, responding to these pictures, um, people were very shocked by these dead bodies. And this is one of the most famous photographs in that album. It is preceded by a paragraph of text, which basically emphasizes the blank horror of war, um, opposed as opposed to the pageantry we might um, associate with going off to war uh, and battle. And it emphasizes that those dead bodies strewn on the landscape, the Battle of Getty, Gettysburg lasted three days. It's really the turning point in the Civil War, very bloody battle. Um, but that all of those dead bodies um, are owing to, again, the, the, the um, South and its decision to secede. Um, then you turn the page and you see this photograph with the title, A Harvest of Death. So the title transposes the image from the specific to the allegorical, obviously referencing the Grim Reaper. Uh, in fact, you see a horse, a man on a horse there on the horizon line. Uh, and um, the landscape kind of dematerializes as our eye moves back into that landscape so that, again, um, it becomes an allegory of death uh, and destruction laid at the hands of the rebels. Uh, it's then when, after, at the end of the Civil War, that somebody like Winslow Homer paints this work, Veteran in a New Field. We can see that he has discarded his Union uniform, um, adopted the clothing of the farmer. He's using an old-fashioned scythe, which again associates him with the Grim Reaper, but um, he is cutting down wheat as if to suggest that the Northern victory is an uh, um, opportunity to restore peace and bounty to the land. Uh, and even the images that begin to be made um, of the West during this period, we're not going to go into detail about that, but uh, Albert Bierstadt, who famously goes to the West on three different occasions, makes sketches, you, uh, has photographs, and then makes these paintings, which are romantic. He often throws in some extra mountains, um, but that is recognizably Yosemite Valley, and those images are also part and parcel of the Civil War in that they, they become a means of reconciliation between the North and the South as people turn their eyes westward as a place where there can be this national project of expansion, which of course involves its own destruction of peoples, the Native Americans, and taking their land, but it's a project that's underwritten by both scientific discovery and religious ideals, that this is the manifest destiny of, of, the, government, of the United States to explore westward. So it's both a means of unification, but a unification, again, at the expense of the peoples, um, the Native American peoples.
Penn School was a school in uh, South Carolina that was founded by missionaries, um, New England-based uh, missionaries to educate um, the children uh, of, of, of ex-slaves. Uh, Lee Richmond Minor was a white photographer uh, who taught at another school that was founded by Northeastern missionaries to educate um, not just African Americans, but um, the children of Native Americans. This school that he was affiliated with was Hampton University or Hampton Institute in Hampton, Virginia. This photograph by Lee Richmond Minor, who was based in Hampton, taking a picture of black students in, um, in South Carolina, uh, it's a remarkable photograph. Um, th th there are many photographers uh, who, who are intrigued with this um, post-emancipation um, experience and are eager to document what the lives of, of, of either ex-slaves or the children of ex-slaves is like. Uh, and um, Miner is a particularly fascinating photo photographer. I was having a conversation yesterday with Anne McCauley, my colleague from Princeton University, who will be doing a talk um, at some point uh, during this um, uh, conference. And um, sh we were talking about uh, Miner as being a part of a group of very interesting photographers working uh, in the United States um, at the turn of the century, um, including uh, Francis Benjamin Johnston, um, F. Holland Day, uh, and um, their ringleader, uh, a man by the name of Clarence Cameron White. Um, all of these photographers um, were what we would call pictorialist. They uh, used their camera uh, to, in some ways, evoke um, um, aspects of a painting. And that could be with soft focus, or it could be with um, an attention, as in the case of this photograph by Miner, to the landscape, the possibilities of the landscape evoking some sort of poetic uh, visual referent. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry I keep on referencing cinema, but as many of you know, I'm a cinema file. <laughs> and um, there's a wonderful film that was done by a filmmaker uh, in the early 90s. Uh, her name is Julie Dash. And the name of that film is Daughters of the Dust. And in her film, she describes this moment. In fact, in that film, um, the, the, the protagonist is a photographer who comes down to document um, a family uh, based in the Sea Islands of South Carolina as they make their move from the South to, uh, to Harlem, New York. Uh, and uh, so when I look at a picture like this, I think about Julie Dash's film, but I also think about, again, this, this interesting um, um, kind of um, in-betweenness, um, educated uh, young um, African Americans um, having to make a decision if they're going to remain uh, in the South to, um, to face discrimination, to, to, to still work with their own people and their own communities, or are they going to get on a boat and go beyond these little rivers and riverlets and find their way to Charleston, find their way to Richmond, find their way to Washington, D.C., find their way to New York City. And this is kind of that moment. And, <laughs> segueing into that moment, uh, we have the work of Jacob Lawrence. Uh, we were very lucky here in France um, uh, some months ago to have an extraordinary exhibition uh, at the Quai Branly um, dealing with the African American experience, dealing with um, discrimination, racism, migration, and um, uh, the curator of that exhibition is sitting here before us, uh, Daniel Soutif, and he um, is very key in bringing the work of Jacob Lawrence to Paris, France. Um, we're looking here at um, an image from the migration series by Jacob Lawrence. Jacob Lawrence was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um, he was the child of migrants from South Carolina. Um, his family eventually moves to Harlem, where he is a young witness to this efflorescence of cultural activity that we call the Harlem Renaissance. 
And in the late 1930s, early 1940s, he takes it upon himself to create work, to create modern work that will deal with this migration experience. And this is panel three. It has a very long title, The Migration of the Negro. Um, in every town, Negroes were leaving by the hundreds to go north and enter into northern industries. Um, the title tells you one thing, but the image tells you something else. The image are a mound, a hill of people. And we can tell from their silhouettes that they're looking um, to, the, um, to, the, to the left um, of the picture frame. And they almost create a hill, um, as you see. Um, some um, have um, things on their backs, their, their, their valises, their sacks. Um, some um, are um, dressed um, differently. Some we might assume are female. Um, this is an abstract modernist kind of work. So, so things aren't as, as naturalized as, as in an illusionistic representation, but we still get a sense of landscape, people, and birds. And, and clearly Lawrence is, 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 is making a, a juxtaposition of, 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 of both the migration of African Americans from the rural South to the urban North as a kind of, 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 of an intuitive um, migratory movement that we see in the birds that are making their way um, from one side of the picture frame to the other. Uh, again, Lawrence was a very young man when he did this work. He was in his 20s. And um, he had studied at the Art Students League, um, and he had also studied um, privately with a number of artists. But there was a sense um, by his teachers not to push him too far in an academic vein, to really let him use his modernist um, um, skills to, 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 to create a very evocative series. This is a series that there are, there are, there are, in, there are 60 panels. And um, at the moment that it was on display in New York City, um, a decision was made to split the series. And I believe the even numbered panels ended up at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And the odd number panels ended up at the Phillips Collection uh, in Washington, DC. So it's rare when all of these um, images uh, get pulled together. But um, it's an extraordinary series that, again, both speaks to the landscape, but also speaks to how bodies intersect with that landscape and, and give it meaning. Uh, so I think you can see in the way we've been tracing the historiography through landscape images that there was a quite dramatic shift that began, I think, with scholarship in the 1980s to think about images within their political and historical uh, context to think about the realities of race, gender, uh, class, sexuality. And um, with time, scholars have looked at different places as places of contact zones uh, where people migrate, sometimes by choice, sometimes not by choice. Um, and that's all related to, I think, what uh, often people refer to as a transatlantic turn in um, scholarship about the United States, thinking about how not just goods um, and people and ideas, but art move with globalization um, and challenging national borders. But of course, as we see in our own present moment, those national borders can reassert themselves sometimes with vociferousness creating new alliances, disrupting others. Um, and so to trace some of that, we're shifting our attention to Los Angeles here and to an artist who was, of course, British, David Hockney, who came to Los Angeles and ended up painting works that are often seen as representing California, representing Southern California to the world. Um, David Hockney came first in January of 1964. He was lured by photographs that he had seen in Physique Pictorial, which was an underground bodybuilding magazine uh, published out of Los Angeles by Bob Miser. It included uh, photographs of 
young men with just strapping poses, often engaged in domestic rituals. And so David Hockney, a gay artist living in, L in uh, London, thought, this is the place for me to go. I'm going to go to Los Angeles. And when he landed, he sought out Bob Meiser's studio, found it a bit seedy, and he takes those models and transposes them into a different kind of setting, a setting that's related to um, a much more posh, posh neighborhood in Los Angeles, Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, and so forth. A lot of his images either, well, they either represent friends of his, Peter Schlesinger was his partner during that time in LA, or they're anonymous men based on photographs from physique pictorial, such as the image on the right, man taking a shower in Beverly Hills. But again, the, the, when you look at the source photograph, he's been plucked out of that setting and, and kind of a cramped, modest interior and placed into this lush interior. As Hockney always famously said, he was fascinated by the bathrooms in, in uh, Beverly Hills because there were these plush carpets right outside the showers and said, very un-British. Um, so, in any case, he uh, represents these men transforming the image of Los Angeles. Uh, here, a picture titled California, so that these nude men bobbing in the water um, of the swimming pools in, in the backyards of these suburban homes, modernist ranch style homes, become an allegory for California. When his pictures, uh, when one of his pictures, A Bigger Splash, appeared on the cover of Rainer Banham's book, Rainer Banham being another British um, person who came to Los Angeles, was fascinated by Los Angeles, and uh, published this book, an, A Los Angeles and Architecture of Four Ecologies. He put Hockney's image on the cover as if it's a window onto the world of Los Angeles, as it's a representative of Los Angeles. And those images then came to define the city for a European uh, and American audience at the time. Um, but, you know, when we talk about transatlantic movement, we have to keep in mind how people move and why they move and do they move by choice. And, of course, David Hockney came to the United States by choice. He took a jet. He was able to do that um, as an artist. But uh, a younger artist by the name of Ramiro Gomez, who has reworked a lot of Hockney's paintings, um, is the son of two undocumented Mexican immigrants who came to Los Angeles across the border, a border which currently our president wants to reinforce. Um, and they subsequently have become American citizens. But when he was born in 1986, they were undocumented immigrants. And his he went to an art school by the name of Cal Arts. It's a very famous art school in LA. Um, but he dropped out and was working for a family as a kind of nanny for the children when he started to paint the locale, Beverly Hills, and started to redo Hockney's paintings. And so um, you'll note that, of course, he puts the laboring body into those spaces that are either, in Hockney's case, empty or they have these young nude men in the swimming pools. So here we have No Splash from 2014 with the Mexican immigrants who are cleaning the pool. Or in this case, woman cleaning a shower in Beverly Hills, um, in which again we, we focus our attention on the people who care for these spaces. So he brings attention to the race and ethnicity of the and the labor involved in maintaining these pristine modernist homes, which are also a space of sexual fantasy for Hockney. So when we begin to deal with issues of sexuality and race and class uh, within the built environment, we move away from distinguishing the quintessential features of the nation, but to thinking about encounters that happen over space and time in particular places. And the 
various kinds of identities that they produce um, around sexuality or class. I was thinking as I was looking at the Hockneys that um, David Hockney is from Yorkshire, and I have a very good friend at Duke University who uh, is from York. And um, looking at these paintings by uh, Hockney, I, one can definitely say he has he has definitely left Yorkshire. <laughs> I mean, L.A. and the colors and and the the tiles and the pools. Um, they, they really speak to the sun. Really speak to you know another mindset, not just something that he actually saw because that does exist. But we're also talking about a kind of an imaginary. Uh, and in that way, Hockney is um, a later version, one could say, of Albert Bierstadt's, you know, Yosemite, uh, in the sense that we have in both cases, you know, Europeans who have a vision, uh, have a fantasy, have a dream of America that gets realized in reality, but, but as, as, as Professor Whiting said, um, artistic license kicks in. To, to create you know something even more fantastic, something even more extraordinary. So when we look at that Bierstadt landscape, one is overwhelmed by the majesty of it, the power of those of those mountains. With the Hockneys, the colors are so crystalline. Uh, and, and then <laughs> to have um, 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 Ramiro R R R Gomez doing a kind of a counterpoint in this moment of postmodern kind of critique and, and, and visual uh, analysis is, is quite extraordinary. Um, are, do we have our, yeah, and so while we're still in LA, we, we thought it would be interesting for you to think and reflect on um, a collective of Mexican American artists um, that go by the name of ASCO. And in the mid 1970s, they did this um, this 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 photograph called "Decoy Gang War Victim." Um, this is a, a photograph that was taken on the streets of, of of L.A. And this is one of the members of the collective ASCO. And um, that um, member of the collective is um, posed on the ground, uh, and only in that kind of quintessential L.A. at night noirish kind of way do we see these strange colors, the blues and the reds and the, and the, the raking lights from the streets. And, 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 and so what Osco has done is they've created a kind of an image that fits into a fantasy, fits into an imaginary around gang violence on the streets of, of LA. But, but, but the reminder here for you is that this is made up. This is an image that they have, they have kind of conjured and performed as a photograph. Uh, and, and the piece was so successful, it actually appeared um, shortly after it was created on the cover of Art Forum magazine. Because um, even um, Art Forum uh, in New York understood that, that this was a collective that was really pushing and, and making us question the notion of what's true um, in photographic uh, uh, um, parlance, um, in media. And, and Osco layers that onto a whole issue of, of, of kind of representations of, 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 of Chicano Americans and, and misrecognition and misrepresentations uh, as, as seen in a work such as um, Decoy Gang War Victim. Yes, and I, I just wanted to add that well, Osco means nausea in Spanish, as some of you probably know, and it, it is a group of performative artists who were also in dialogue with both conceptual art in Los Angeles, um, because they too had, some of them had gone to CalArts uh, and been fully steeped in that, but they're also in dialogue with the Chicano art movement, which is an art movement that more typically is about celebration of identity um, and making large-scale murals that celebrate a history of Mexican-Americans, and uh, they were critiquing that kind of work as well as conceptualism by doing these performances which they photographed and, and circulated. So this is, I think, what we're interested in, or we often see a lot of scholars interested in today, is this kind of encounter um, uh, of different practices and people who are in dialogue with each other in a particular place. And I was just going to add also that um, one of the great things about studying American art and teaching American art 
uh, in the 21st century is that um, now we um, think in a much more um, um, uh, layered and nuanced way as to what constitutes uh, American art. Um, when um, Cecile and I were in, in, in school, um, often um, the class began uh, in Jamestown or, or in, in, in Massachusetts. And now, when we both teach American art, we start in the Southwest. <laughs> Because that's really where, you know, with with the um, the Pueblo cultures and 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 the border that did not exist between Mexico and the U.S., where we have cultures moving back and forth. So so thinking about um, Latino culture uh, in the context of American art makes absolute sense as one thinks, you know, critically about um, the work that gets produced. I was also going to mention ever so quickly about Asco, is is that we have this amazing tradition of the calavera. You know, in, uh, in, in Mexican art, folk art, you know, the celebration of All Saints Day, where skeletons, you know, get paraded and they are, they're dressed in suits and they, and they um, are, are, are dressed in, in fancy gowns and, and they go through the, 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 the machinations of, of, of life. Uh, and this is something that's really kind of contained within, you know, Mexican uh, culture. Um, I'm also thinking about uh, Aztec uh, imagery that, 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 that uses death as, as an emblem to reflect on and think about as a continuum. So thinking about that in the context of Asco is not that much of a stretch. Kerry James Marshall is a contemporary artist. Uh, he's working here and now. He just had an amazing exhibit at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Now in, Los now in L.A. <laughs> and, uh, and he actually studied uh, in Los Angeles. He's a, he was born in Alabama and uh, came to Los Angeles with his family as a, as a child. And I think he was at Otis Art Institute, where he worked with the very renowned um, African-American um, uh, draftsman and painter Charles White. Um, anyway, Kerry James Marshall um, is, is now considered a major figure in American art. And um, this painting, I, uh, uh, I thought, would be really interesting for you to think about, um, 7 a.m. Uh, Sunday morning, because it, it's a very big um, uh, a canvas. Uh, and uh, it actually uh, is, is close to my heart because it was, uh, it, his, his location is Chicago, which is where I'm from. Um, we've talked about New York, we've talked about LA, and um, sometimes we forget that, that the Midwest uh, is, has its own kind of energies and artistic traditions. Uh, as um, Jeff Koons talked a little bit about yesterday uh, in terms of his engagements with the Harry Who in, uh, in Chicago. But this painting is, I think, almost a, a, a post-meditation on all the positive things we t or the dreams that we talked about in terms of migration. This is almost like the nightmare of, 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 of life in the 21st century in many urban centers. And when I go home and visit my family uh, in Chicago and I go through some of the communities where they're used to be vibrant uh, stores and, and activities and people, um, some of the blocks are just raised. They're, they're, they're abandoned. Um, urban renewal has kicked in. And so we have wide expanses where there used to be homes and, 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 and housing. Now there's nothing. And I think Carrie James Marshall is channeling that kind of sense of, of, of emptiness, that sense of ennui. Uh, that that, that um, we see sometimes as we go through the south side of, of Chicago. Yes, we have um, Rothschild's liquor store. Yes, we have um, a housing project. We have those same birds that we saw in the Jacob Lawrence uh, uh, painting, but, but now they're not so much um, harbingers of, of, of a better life as much as they are reminders of, 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 of the kind of emptiness and vacuity that sometimes um, when people experience uh, in the urban uh, experience. And yet, on the right side of the painting, he has these, these geometries. These, um, these, these elements that seem to almost speak to a kind of a, the dreamy and sparkly qualities that, that one can experience even in the ghettos of, of America. Looking up in the sky on a Sunday morning and seeing the light you know, kind of pierce through the clouds. So, so, so Carrie James Marshall here was very much thinking not just about the challenges of, of the urban experience in the 20th first century, but, but the glimmers of, of light and, and energy that, that might um, reap something positive out of all of that. So um, we just have a couple minutes left as we have another uh, 
talk starting in 10 minutes. Uh, and so hopefully our selection of images and uh, has given you some sense of the way that the field has changed dramatically in a relatively short period of time. It is a young academic discipline, um, but I would say in 40 years we've seen this shift from looking for uh, one kind of set of characteristics that exemplify the American nation to an emphasis on fluidity, hybridity, and multiplicity of peoples and practices. Now, there have been those who have questioned whether this is just another form of American exceptionalism um, rearing its ugly head, but um, I think that the, that the discipline has expanded uh, tremendously, again, thanks also to the encounter between scholars from around the world um, and their thoughts about American art. And Alors, merci beaucoup. Merci. <laughs> Au revoir.